knowledge plus experience equals confidence. And in the absence of experience, you need a playbook. So document early and often, and then um, scale of leveraging technology. Like you should be doing everything in your power to not necessarily just move to hire more people um, because it's it's very expensive to just bring on employees, especially if there's not systems that allow that employee to scale their activity as well. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Samson Jagoras is a real estate expert. He is an entrepreneur and a business advisor. Samson, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. Pleasure's mine. Three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show, 90 seconds or less. Where did you start? Where are you now? How'd you get there? Yeah, so I grew up in Los Angeles, California, and uh, I'm a heavy dose of punk rock, skateboarding, and sports. Found football when I was 14, fell in love with it, made it my life's goal to play college ball. I ended up going to a Division II school in New Mexico. After playing there for one season, I knew that I was not happy playing D2 ball, so I walked away from my scholarship after my sophomore year. Took the walk on at the University of Colorado, and thankfully got put back on scholarship a year later. I went to school, studied integrative human physiology. Thought I'd want to be a doctor or do something like that. Uh, playing college football at the D1 level and trying to keep your grades up, man, I struggled to have the, uh, let's call it medical school uh, GPA. <laughs> so so, um, so I started looking at the world of strength and conditioning, kind of a natural fit, which I really loved. But man, it's a long, hard, arduous road to become a you know, division one head strength coach. You know, you're talking maybe eight to 10 years before you even get a shot. Um, so I was very blessed. My, uh, wife who I met when I was 20, her dad was in the world of futures and commodities. So I did the totally logical thing, graduated on a Friday with a degree in physiology and walked into a futures and commodities brokerage on a Monday, spent three months studying to get my series three futures and commodities brokerage license. And, uh, I'll never forget it. September 29th, 2008, Dow Jones fell 777 points in a single day. Yep. Boom, got baptized in the deep end of the swimming pool. Um, but it was the best thing that could have happened to me because I quickly learned just the value of owning assets. Um, you know, my my traders and investors who were just speculative got crushed. You know, the first time you watch somebody run their account up to a million back down to 25,000, uh, you realize that leverage has a, it cuts both ways. Yep. Um, but my guys that kept making money were producers, farmers, um, miners you know, guys that actually owned hard assets, right? And they would just use the market to hedge. Right. That opened my eyes to just the world of hard assets. And then, you know, just started pursuing this idea of passive income and cash flow. So uh, after doing trading for about four years, sleeping with the laptop next to my bed, watch markets like the coffee market open at one in the morning, I uh, decided I was going to leave. I was going to go be a financial planner. And then I got uh, blessed with the opportunity to join a marketing and technology startup called Madwire. And uh, we took that company from zero to a little over 100 million a year in revenue and about 600 employees or so. Um, about 2018, started to get a little burnt out on that. And uh, I was also responsible for, we were, I think, hiring about 100, 150 people a year at that point. And so I think unemployment at the time was like 2.89%. We were in the largest expansion since World War II. So I started looking around, having been baptized in 2008, going, man, things are just a little too good. About every eight to 10 years, something something falls apart. So I started unloading my smaller real estate portfolio, you know, singles and doubles, things that I didn't think were that well positioned. And I started working towards uh, scaling up into large commercial multifamily, found a good mentor, started finding some good partners. And uh, here we are today in the uh, 2022, geez, 2022. And uh, now I'm, we're just putting together deals. And um, I'm also the VP of strategic investments for Remax Commercial Alliance here in Colorado. So really like the investments arm of the commercial platform for the Alliance team. We've got about 800 brokers. Um, so really trying to help grow that uh, piece of their business as well. That is awesome. Now you called the company Madwire. Was that the, the one you had scaled to 600 plus employees? Yep. Have you, have you exited that or you still have part of I'm still, I'm a shareholder. Yeah. I mean, I'm not actively involved in the, in the business anymore. Um, still cranking away, 
Uh, obviously a lot changed during COVID, the dynamics of that, but all for the good, you know, it, some of that was forced change on the business. Um, but yeah, marketing technology. So, you know, working with small to medium sized businesses specifically. Right. So, you know, you, this, this podcast is all about scaling commercial real estate, right? So it's no different than any other business. Um, so how do you do that? You know, and how do you, how do you uh, leverage technology and outsource talent and, and whatnot in order to get drive more leads, you know, that's basically what we were doing for customers. I too have had my series three and my series 30. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a rare, yeah. rare to meet a, a fellow futures broker. Right. And so I, I have a, a unique understanding of that 1 a.m. checking the markets like, oh, crud, beans are going down, like yeah. whatever it is. And, I, and the reason I touch on that is because you know, you mentioned something that was your producers. It was your, it was your farmers. It was your, you know, miners. It was the people that owned hard assets. I mean, they were just using the market to hedge, right? And for those of you that don't understand what we're talking about, it's a okay. The, the the point here is that owning hard assets has value. How much of that do you think ties over into the investor conversations that you have, or that you're seeing or hearing people talk about today, when the value of owning hard assets? Yeah, I mean, I. You know, I think in the in the fiat money world that we live in today, uh, we're seeing you know seven dollar gas prices. I think in California, um, I know it's just cracked over four bucks in Colorado. So, I think everybody's starting to realize that cash is trash, and uh, you got to you got to own assets and things that are income producing if you are going to get ahead. You know, um, so it comes up quite a bit. We also talk about just coming from the world of futures, which are highly highly leveraged. You know, you can get 10 to one on a, on a crude oil contract, right. um, which for those of you who don't understand that world, uh, you know, $5 swing is 5,000 uh, bucks right. in your account. You know, most stock traders couldn't handle that over six months, let alone just a couple hours. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so getting deleveraged, uh, de-risking your assets. And we talk a lot about just sharp ratios and risk rewards. And if you look at the sharp ratios on, futures contracts, it's pretty much zero. Like it's just a matter of time before you lose everything where, you know, co uh, core commercial real estate is, you know, some of the best sharp ratios you can get, right. The best risk adjusted returns. So that comes up tons when we're talking with investors. I think most, what shies most people away from investing in real estate is it's just, it's a work, man. It's, it's not easy, especially in this current environment when everybody's chasing deals. So you got to work with guys like us who are actively building a pipeline and networking with brokers and property managers, actually find those deals and manage those assets and go do what you do, be a lawyer, be a doctor or whatever that may be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely, absolutely valuable. Scaling a company to 600 employees, especially that quickly. What were some things that as you went through that process that, that you would say, Hey, if I had to do that again, I would do it differently. Yeah, hundred percent. Document early and often. Um, you're always trying to uh, move yourself out of a role. You got to delegate to elevate, and you can't do that if you haven't documented the process. If you're the only person with the esoteric knowledge, it's also horrible for training and scaling people. Uh, most most employers who don't have good documented systems or processes default to the watch me method. Hey Sam, I'm gonna pick up this phone and make this phone call. Watch me, and I'm just supposed to absorb and assimilate. There's a reason that like the highest level athletes, let's talk about NFL professional athletes. There's a reason they have a playbook, right? So that they can go be great athletes. So I can hire somebody with all the intangible skill sets of being a great salesperson, but if they don't have a playbook, then they're going to struggle, right? Because knowledge plus experience equals confidence. And in the absence of experience, you need a playbook. So document early and often, and then um, scale of leveraging technology. Like you should be doing everything in your power to not necessarily just move to hire more people because um, it's it's very expensive to just bring on employees, especially if there's not systems that allow that employee to scale their activity as well. So, you know, everybody, at least in the world that I came from, from marketing and technology, everybody's trying to find this, you know, singular solution where they can get more done with just one platform and where you got to find good platforms where you can find good integration points. So those are things that I've carried over into my business today. I mean, we document everything from top to bottom to from, you know, how we solicit and communicate with brokers to how we run a financial model to how we move deals through the system um, to what happens when a new employee comes on board. You know, how, how does that system actually 
work. And, you know, we're just a, a small company in comparison to some of these larger entities, you know, we were at 600 employees. I mean, there's still some processes that were broken. And we really saw in that company, we really saw the effects of that once we went remote, right? Mm. Because when you're in a completely decentralized company, it's a lot harder, right? Because maybe your workflow, you're working from eight o'clock at night till one in the morning, but I'm working at, you know, seven in the morning till 12 in the afternoon. How do we have good asynchronous communication and line of sight into what your workflow is? when you know we can't communicate in real time yeah that that that's absolutely um yeah absolutely valuable information there what are you using because it's one thing it's one thing to document it's one thing to put something in a word document it's another thing to put it in a loom video or screencast-o-matic or whatever your source of hey recording it so that someone else can then take it and repeat it but once you've done that then how are you building is there a software you're using that puts it in, that plugs it into the system where they can say, okay, this is what this person is. This is what their role is, is what they do. Or how do you organize even all that information that you've created? So we have a combination of, we use Google drive heavily, but we use monday.com. So monday.com works phenomenal just from a deal flow standpoint, tons of workflow automations built in and auto assignment features built in. So as we move things through our deal flow process and moves from one stage to the next, the, the appropriate people get notified to then take action. So I don't have to call them, send them a message, send them an email. And then everything just lives and breathes in there. Even if it's a link to our deal room, which exists inside of Google Docs, as, as the deal evolves and it gets through pre-underwriting, we then you know, permission a folder that has all the financial modeling, financial documents, contracts, so on and so forth. And then that grows over time. So it's all in one place. Um, beyond that, I mean, Monday pretty much solves everything from our, you know, marketing cadence to our to-do system. We operate using the entrepreneurial operating system. So, uh, we're huge advocates of that. So our scorecard lives inside of there. Our real-time metrics live inside of there. Our to-dos live inside of there. And again, those all have automations. Like when people aren't getting things done, they're getting notified, Hey, this is past due as well as the integrator on our team. Who's our partner, Brad, who is, a uh, actually Lieutenant commander in the Navy. He's a really good XO. He operates all that. So then he gets notified on who's not doing what, and then he can circle up with those people. So everything's designed for us to just operate asynchronously mm. as well as uh, decentralized. And man, it's been incredible to see it work. Um, I go to sleep and wake up in the morning and the analyst has got, you know, 32 notifications for me, which is awesome. Now you said that Brad is your integrator. What does that mean? Yeah. So when we first launched, I was the one that was probably the most familiar with the system, but inside the world of EOS, you know, you basically have a visionary and you have an integrator and usually people are one or the other. They're one part visionary or, or, or integrator. I'm a little bit of both. Um, I'm probably better as a visionary just because I, I tend to get bogged down in the operational logistics. Um, in the world of the Navy, they, you have a CEO or commanding officer who's like looking outward and you have an EXO who's looking internal. And so that's kind of how we think about it. Brad's incredible at that. So he's just responsible for you know running the meetings, making sure that people are executing on their to-dos, uh, making sure we're hitting the scorecard metrics and, and kind of seamlessly integrating sales and marketing operations, HR and finance. Obviously, we're all involved as principals on that. And uh, Brad is incredibly tactical, tactical as an EOD specialist. Um, but man, you need somebody who just sits in that seat and owns that every single week. Yeah, no, that that's absolutely, I, lo I love what you, absolutely true. I love what you said there, uh, you know, about the difference between a visionary and an integrator, because it is true and it's tough. It's tough, I think, for a lot of people who are scaling their businesses to find that complementary partner. You're either one, if you're one or the other, and especially if you're, you know, if you're not a mix like you are, it's tough to find that person. How did you guys form your team and the partnership? And when did it make sense for you to say, hey, look, let's join forces? You know, we were all going down the road in this mastermind, uh, just learning the multifamily business. And uh, Jeremy, our partner who came on this podcast, he uh, he's a very analytical mind with school for finance, you know, as a commercial loan originator. Um so being, you know, I spent nine years of my career in strategy, right? So I'm really good. My, my superpower is identifying other people's talents and helping them get into the right seat to execute and like orchestrating that. That's part of what makes me a, a pretty good visionary. So I saw his talent and I can underwrite, just like I can replace the shingles on my roof. 
I probably shouldn't, right? There's people that are just better at it. Um, and then Brad, you know, he's being in the, in the Navy, he's traveled all around the United States as well as around the entire world. So, you know, leading, being high level ranking officer, he's obviously an ex-communicator, but he's also just really well connected. I mean, we can go to pretty much any, any state and he knows somebody, right, via the Navy. Um, so that kind of made him a natural fit to be leading capital development. Mm. Um, and then my background, I'm, I'm probably the most seasoned as it relates to just scaling a company and raising money. And so that kind of made me the natural fit is for the president or CEO function. And so we all just had a shared heart for what we wanted to do, which is we were all chasing more time, you know, with time uh, comes more impact, right? Because if I had time freedom, what would I do? I'd spend more time with my family, but there's only so many hours in the day that I can do that. And there's things that are important to me, like getting more involved in my community and my church and um, whatnot. So we decided to come together, not only to create time freedom for ourselves and for our investors, but also to create our own endowment. So part of what we're working on is building our own endowment that takes equity in our in our deals and actually creates revenue and perpetuity for charities that we care about versus just making like one-off charitable donations. That's fantastic. Very cool. Very, very cool. I love, I love the organic kind of way you guys you know, put that, uh, put that together. Let's talk about a mastermind real quick. It's probably the last thing we chat about here before we have to sign off. But when it comes to getting into a mastermind, what would you recommend to somebody, uh, when it comes to selecting one? Well, in this particular case, if you want to get in the world of like multifamily investing, right, you, you got to go find a niche. So ours was like mastermind meets mentorship. And, um, I would say you got to be cautiously optimistic, right? A lot of these groups are just using their mentees as a way to build their own uh, capital raising pipeline. Right. And um, it's just a glorified multi-level marketing campaign is what it is. And so a lot of, um, a lot of syndicators get caught in the trap of just becoming capital raising companies. And, you know, my take on that is there is plenty of capital. In fact, capital might be the weakest part of the deal um, because it's so plentiful. There's just so much of it. So if the only thing you have is the ability to raise capital, then you're 100% stuck on somebody else finding a deal. Um, so we did, we did the exact opposite where we just focused on deal sourcing and acquisitions. So be sure that what you're getting yourself into actually aligns with what your business goals are. We did not want to be a capital development company. We wanted to be an acquisitions and asset management company. So we sought out people who were doing that, who are acquisitions and asset managers, not capital development companies. That is that that's interesting. You know, the two things I say it over and over on this show is that you need deals and money. So let's say, just for sake of argument, you guys went out, you found your first deal. How did you then have the capital to back it up and say, hey, we're actually going to be able to get this closed? Well, it's, you know, you're always raising capital, right, within your own network. But on top of that, you're just developing strong joint venture partners, right? So you, you really need five people to get a deal done. You need somebody to find the deal, somebody to get it over the line, somebody to make it viable, somebody to bring the money, and somebody to sell it on the back end. That's 100% split five ways. That's 20% a piece, right? So there's always somebody who has too much money and not enough deals, right? Or they have uh, not enough time. So one of our our co-GP partner is a very large, very successful storage acquisitions and developer. So it knows exactly what they're doing, translates perfectly over to multifamily. They have a construction company as well, but what they don't have is deep end roads into the 300, network, 300 brokers that we have in our network that we consistently call on every single week looking for deals, right? So to them, we're really valuable, right? And so through that network, you know, it's not so much about how much money you have as much as who, how deep is your bench and who's on your team. And then through those, you know, joint venture partnerships, we have access to capital groups who want to raise on our behalf. And then if you don't, you know, you don't have that, then you have equity brokers. And if you don't have that, there's others, you know, capital development groups that you can work with. And you can do a combination of raising your own equity and working with some other capital developers and carving up the, the acquisition fee in a market like this. It ultimately comes down to finding the great deals because if there's great deals, then there's more meat on the bone and everybody can eat. But if you're just focused on being a capital guy, then you're going to have to take the scraps of like, hey, well, this is what we're willing to give you because you're just another capital guy. You're not a, you don't, you're not the lead sponsor on the deal, right? <clears throat> right. 
Yep, that makes all the sense in the world. All the sense in the world. Samson, thanks for coming on today. You've you bet. shared with us quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of things to think think about uh, through your you know your experience scaling a marketing company. Uh, we talked a lot about tech. We talked, um, you know, just about documents. What do you call it? Document to delegate, documentation and processes, and kind of the way that you guys have uh, been able to grow your company. And certainly, uh, certainly enjoy your thoughts also behind, um, you know, how to provide value as a multifamily syndicator. And you know, according to you, it's uh, you know, you don't want to be just that capital raiser. So certainly uh, love and appreciate that perspective. If our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Check out our website. It's thegrowthdue.com, or you can connect with me on LinkedIn, Samson Jagoris. I'm sure Sam will drop it in the show notes. Um, shoot me a DM. I'm always happy to chat. Absolutely will do. Thank you again, Samson. Appreciate it. You bet.